Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chit Heads. My guest today is Kiki Flynn. Kiki Flynn is a renowned Ashtanga yoga teacher, wellness consultant, and personal coach. With 34 years of experience, she has pioneered a career at the street strategic intersection of wellness, natural lifestyle, yoga, inspired living, and organic beauty. Kiki is a spokesperson and community builder with a dedicated YouTube and blogging audience. Kiki facilitates and implements transformational programs for individuals and organizations. Her clients include Hollywood and Fortune 500 leaders, as well as adults and children with therapeutic needs. She develops and executes yoga and wellness programs for spinal cord injury at the AXIS Project, as well as independence care systems providing yoga for communities with disability. Based in New York City, Kiki also consults remotely with clients around the world. A yoga educator, she teaches workshops locally and worldwide. Kiki graduated with honors from NYU with a BFA in drama, and it is here she was introduced to yoga. <clears throat> As an actress, she starred and co-starred in Hollywood, New York, and independent projects in film, television, and theater. Kiki continued her yoga studies traveling to India more than a dozen times, studying closely with Ashtanga Yoga founder Sri K. Patabi Joyce in yoga therapeutics, wellness traditions, Sanskrit, and philosophy. In 1996, Kiki opened her first yoga school in Los Angeles, where she taught for 10 years. Here, she was honored to host her teacher, Patabi Joyce, as well as celebrated kirtan singer Krishna Das in his first California appearances. She also worked as a yoga consultant in film and television, notably on The Next Best Thing, starring Madonna. Woo! So with that, hello, Kiki. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm so happy to be here, or for you to be here. Yes, Me? we are here in your apartment in Harlem, New York City, a beautiful apartment. We've just been talking about the beautiful um, uh, things you've done to your home to make it a really warm and inviting space. Thank you. So the first thing I'd love to just discuss is the incredible life experience in this practice that you've had. Your, your practice goes back, as I mentioned in the bio, 34 years. And so I would love to just um, take a moment to hear a little bit about your story and how you found yoga and maybe the, the moments of, of awakening or realization or, 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 or some you know, important moments along the way that you'd like to share with the audience. I was introduced to yoga at NYU through a voice and speech class as mm. part of my conservatory training. And the teacher began the class with what I found out later was kundalini yoga, like mm. a lot of the kundalini kriyas, the breath of fire, things like that. And then we did a, um, a guided relaxation. Mm. And I rem she guided it. And I remember that I truly relaxed <laughs> for the first time in several years. Like I felt some kind, maybe in my entire life or something, my entire conscious life, I just felt my whole body just release mm. this kind of armor of tension. And up until this time, everything we did with our previous voice and speech teacher and in many of these classes was there were little stages in the room we sat in chairs like an audience, and when you worked, you went up on the stage. Mm -hmm. It was very old-fashioned. I eventually left that program. I thought it was too old-fashioned. And I went to the experimental theater wing. Um, so we had been doing our monologues and our sonnets or whatever it was from a stage like that. And this teacher said, oh, let's sit in a circle on the floor and let me hear from each of you what you've been working on. Mm -hmm. And I had been with maybe the same 12 people for a whole semester, and I knew them pretty well. We were in hours of classes together, trying to stretch and grow and express ourselves as young actors, and I guess really put the blocks aside, because you mm -hmm. have an idea, this is what I want to achieve, and then when you get in the exercise or on the stage, completely fail at achieving it. And I always wondered, what is standing in my way? Mm. Or why is this different all the time? Is there a means? Or I'm, I'm supposedly learning method acting. What are these means and methods to be clear, to be present, to fulfill, to be effective in my goals, mm -hmm. um, to tell the truth as an actor? You know, that's what I wanted to do. So we sat in the circle, and one person went, and it was like the most 
beautiful they'd ever performed their sonnet or their monologue. And I was like, oh, my God. And then the next one. And then, and then, and then, and then. And everyone was just doing their most beautiful work, Mm -hmm. most truthful, at ease, fully relaxed, very moving. And then it got to me, and I was like, well, I'm so self-conscious analyzing all of this. Mm -hmm. I've probably totally blown my chance (laughs) to have this same experience, but this is still a learning lesson. And then I just remember speaking my sonnet and um, feeling completely alive and at ease. And in that moment, I said, this is incredibly important. I'm going to do this every day for the rest of my life. Wow. And so I... I had a little notebook, and I wrote down everything we had done. And then I would wake up early and do what was in my notebook. And then I kept gathering with more voice and speech classes. Then eventually I left this method acting of Lee Strasberg. I transferred to the Experimental Theater Wing at NYU, where I was introduced to a lot more yoga because I learned yoga as part of an overall sort of... um, an overall sort of vocabulary for maintaining and stretching and extending the performer's instrument, which Mm. is the voice, the body, the emotions, et cetera. And so, you know, just learning a lot of things from world traditions, from different so-called experimental theater, revolutionary theater, et cetera. So yoga played a big part in that. Mm. So my notebook just had more and more stuff in it. And even if I was you know, cocktail waitressing or bartending till four in the morning, in class all day, rehearsing, I was still finding time for this yoga. Mm. And for me, it was not just how do I remove these blocks when I perform? How do I remove these conflicts that I'm not happy with just as a human being? (laughs) Even something is, it used to really trouble me, like, why, when I get around my high school friends, am I just suddenly acting this way? And then when I get around my New York friends, I'm suddenly acting that way. And I would even feel a tension when they would come together. And I mm. thought, who's, why am I tense? Why do I feel divided? Why can't there just be one me? Mm. And just to have this big, peaceful, present experience. So it really was a kind of a, I wouldn't have, been able to call it that at the time, kind of a yoga mind, a quest mm-hmm. for vast consciousness. Mm-hmm. So, so when was it that you encountered um, the first kind of tradition that you would say you uh, associated with? Did you find a shatanga first? I didn't find a shatanga first. I mean, we're I mean, talking you found about nineteen eighty three. Yeah. Mm. There or sooner, or when I graduated NYU. There really was no Ashtanga in New York. Mm. There was very little Ashtanga anywhere. I did meet someone who practiced uh, Ashtanga. Beryl Bender was here in New York. She was on the Upper West Side. Mm. She was really teaching Ashtanga yoga through the New York Roadrunners Club. Mm. And if you weren't in the New York Roadrunners Club you weren't getting Ashtanga. Mm. Ashtanga was really affiliated. Patabi Joyce had visited his first American students um, were from Southern California. Mm. And um, he, they brought him to Southern California, to Encinitas. Then many of them moved to Hawaii. And so then he traveled to Hawaii. So even Ashtanga yoga was known as Maui yoga. Mm. Maui yoga. So, you know, it's it's hard to imagine a time before the internet where everything was available and, you know, a time before even something as elegant as a uh, DVD, you know, when you had <laughs> VHSs and things like that. And there was one yoga magazine, Yoga Journal, and... I that was around back then? It was, and it was almost, I'm not going to say newsprint, <laughs> but it was pretty It was like printed budge. on someone's like dot matrix printer. That, exactly. <laughs> and the thing, looking back, is knowing Yoga Journal sort of from the late 80s, early 90s, any individual that took a full-page ad in Yoga Journal is a top teacher today. Wow. Because there was one magazine, 
17 people read it, and then whatever, 1,700, And there were about 300 people practicing. <laughs> right. And so I guess if you, if an individual felt like, I have a product to share, I make a block, I made it a VHS, I published my own book, I'm teaching a workshop, I want to share it, and they took a full-page ad, those are our... Those are our most well-known teachers today. Wow. Wow. So it's very interesting. probably the first teachers that Yoga Journal said, oh, we're mm-hmm. making DVDs. You, can you be our guy? Can you be our, you know, spokesperson? Wow. Wow. I mean, it's, it's hard to even imagine, like, a time like that because, you know, you, you really saw a New York that looked very different. I mean... It looked very different. Well, you know, there was, there were no, imagine a time when there were no yoga mats, mm-hmm. no yoga clothes, mm-hmm. and we just probably, you know, I wore dance tights, and we wore, like, Hanes, what are known as, I guess, you know, like, wife beaters or something. Mm-hmm. We just wore tank tops, mm-hmm. and um, I don't even know if there were sports bras. <laughs> We just made do. You just made do. Yeah. Dan Capizio unitards. <laughs> How exciting when they had, you know, crushed velvet unitards. <laughs> you were like, yes. Um, and it was, yes. Yeah, so it was a different landscape. So my introduction to yoga actually formally outside of university was Kundalini yoga. Mm. And I was... After NYU, we were already making theater in school. The people that I was really making theater with in school, we had all gravitated to the East Village. There was a lot of exciting uh, art going on, whether Mm. on stage, in dance, in um, painting, etc. So we just continued to make theater. in now in the East Village. So, uh, but I continued to take dance class and I met a guy in a dance class who wasn't really, you know, a dance, he was like, he danced recreationally. Mm. I had studied Afro-Caribbean dance for a long time. Yes. So I had been, inter- I started, I went to an Afro-Caribbean dance class when I was probably 12 years old in London. Wow. Uh-huh. We were supposed to be in ballet class, <laughs> but we were wandering around the halls after class one day, we saw an Afro-Caribbean dance class, and we're like, next week, we're going to go there. <laughs> that looks more fun. That, that really looks fun. Um, so I met a guy through this dance class, pr- very interesting guy, a documentary filmmaker. And one day after class, he said, do you want to get a green juice? <laughs> and I was like, wow. What's a green like, juice? You know, No, I knew what a green juice was. <laughs> I was like, wow, I met someone who knows who drinks green juice. <laughs> so we went for a juice and... Then, of course, it was love. We started dating. <laughs> and after about two weeks of, you know, spending all of our time together or every morning together or whatever, he said, you know, usually I wake up early and go to a yoga class every morning, and I want to get back to that. I was like, really? You go to a yoga class every morning? Great. <laughs> so we went to that class, and it was Kundalini Yoga. Mm. There was probably three, like, you actually went to the Yellow Pages, and you turn to the Ys, and there was probably three to seven yoga schools in New York City. That's so crazy. And so this was someone, uh, Ravi Singh, he taught a class every single morning. It was very rare back then. Yeah. And I think it was, for the East Village, it was really early. It was like 8 a.m. Mm. People thought I was out of my mind. <laughs> uh, so we were in class every morning at 8 a.m., and we did that for several years. And then at a certain point, Ravi said to me, oh, all these health clubs are calling for yoga. I don't have time to teach them. Why don't you go and teach? And I was like, teach? I can't teach. Mm. He's like, but you bought all these books. You know, just go through the books. And so then I started teaching at a health club. Um, this is before Equinox existed. There was just a few health clubs around the city, Apple Health Club. And then I started teaching, I don't want to say teaching, but facilitating classes for my boyfriend, Jeff and I. Yeah. So he'd be like, well, why don't you just do that for us? So I would put together a morning plan and we would practice at home. Mm. 
And then I, yeah, so I've always been very home-oriented in my practice, yeah. right? I started my practice with my little book, and then Jeff and I began practicing at home. And then I met um, Sharon and David. Mm -hmm. We met as artists downtown. Wow. So there was probably, you know, one cup of coffee east of, you know, Avenue A on Avenue B, and it was Life Cafe. And mm -hmm. it was a corner uh, storefront where David rented it for his artist studio. Mm -hmm. So what happened in that neighborhood was when there was this urban blight, a lot of the storefronts, the commercial shops closed down because and the schools closed down. There was no new kids being born, and so a lot of the schools closed down, and a lot of buildings were abandoned, and landlords, rather than maintain buildings, they abandoned them and hired arsonists yeah, to burn them. I heard about so that. So yeah. there was rubbles, and I read recently, at one point in the South Bronx, there was 300 fires a day. Oh, my God. So here in this landscape. So now what's happening is a lot of artists are living in these buildings mm -hmm. with these boarded up storefronts. Yeah. And they're going to the landlord and saying, can I rent that storefront? And they're putting artist studios, many of them turning into galleries or little performance clubs. And it was very exciting. People were paying $200 rent for these little storefronts. Oh, I wish. My apartment was $235. Oh. And I made pee -pee. that in one night of cocktail waitressing or bartending. And that's really also why we had such an exciting art explosion at that time, mm -hmm. because I could work twice a week and pay my rent, pay my bills, live budgetary, you know, buy organic food at the health food store, which people also thought was crazy. <laughs> and I could also, like, go to Europe twice a year, go to Mexico, go to Oaxaca, because flights were two ninety nine dollars round trip. So you'd see it in the Village Voice, you'd walk to some travel agency on Broadway, like where Shala and Jiva Mukti are now. You'd walk to some travel agency, you'd go in, and you'd say, oh, yeah, I want a round-trip ticket to London. And they'd be like, yeah, it's two ninety nine, And you'd, like... Give them the cash from your bartending. Then you'd have this ticket where you could just call and be like, oh, actually, I want to come home a week later. And they'd be like, no problem. Yeah, you could probably give it to a friend and be like, I can't go. Here's my ticket. Uh, it was such a different time. Such a different time. So because of the low rent, we were able to really invest ourselves in whatever, yoga, dance, performance, have time to create work, have time to sort of work on the mind. Um, so, so then we did Kundalini Yoga. Then from going to Life Cafe, I got to know David. So he turned his studio. So many people came in to his studio that he eventually just started serving coffee. And Snapple, as I recall. <laughs> Snapple is like still being made. Like it was a very homemade natural soda. We were like, wow, Snapple. Um, <laughs> And then that eventually became a cafe. I eventually met Sharon through a local choreographer. We were cast in some outdoor performance piece together, and that's really how I met them. Hmm. And then I would run into them on the street, and they would say, oh, we're teaching yoga, and they would give me a flyer, and I would stick it on the fridge. And... Back then, we were always handing out flyers. It's like, I'm doing a dance performance. Oh, I did costumes for the show. Oh, I'm in, this I'm in that. I'm doing one-woman show here. I used to write and perform one-woman shows, and then I worked. I was with a theater company, my NYU friends, and then worked with a lot of other performers. We, people were performing all the time in galleries and this and that. So it just went on. They went on the fridge, and I remember stacking one on top of the other. I think they had gone and trained at the Shivananda Center in India near Trivandrum, now they were teaching. So then eventually, Jeff and I were mostly doing home practice. And then one day I was just like, well, maybe I'll go take a class with them. Yeah. And I like pulled the flyer off the fridge and I was like, what? It was a block <laughs> away. I was on 9th and B. It was at 8th and B. It's where Guy teaches Ashtanga Yoga now okay. downtown. And uh, it was kind of like a rental dance studio. And they rented the place 
for just a few classes a week. It was like Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Mm. And every day, David would be hosing the urine and the feces off the steps and lighting nag champa, you know, and spinning it around. And this is, you know, the rise of the crack academic. And I can't even, like, I could never really explain to you what it was like. It was, no, it was... It was it a really, unique New York. Well, you know, yeah. all of Manhattan was dangerous, but certain areas were more dangerous. But somehow there we were. A lot of yogis came out of the East Village. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of yoga schools. So... I had been, so at that time, what they were teaching was very, it was Shivananda mm -hmm. yoga with some creative flows and maybe um, um, influenced by Dharma Mitra. Sharon had a dance background. So creative, but kind of hatha based. So that type of, had the sun salutation that we don't see very much anymore. Um, and then headstands and shoulder stands, which we really didn't do in the Kundalini. So that was really exciting. I remember running into Ravi Singh at the bank because, of course, there's like one bank <laughs> on Second Avenue. There's no ATMs, right? Whatever you took out of the bank on Friday, it had to last. Um, and he's like, wow, I haven't seen you. And I was like, oh, I've been doing Hatha yoga with Sharon and David. Mm. Like, everybody just kind of knew each other. He's like, mm. oh, yeah, I know them. And he said, wow, cool. Can you stand on your head? And I said, yeah. He's like, wow. Because <laughs> they weren't standing on their head at that time, <laughs> or even, I don't know now, in Kundalini yoga. Um, Leslie Kamenoff also taught down in kind of like an artist studio space, I think on, I can't remember if it's 7th and B or 4th and B. So a lot of yoga down there. Mm. I mean, a lot. If there were 10 schools in all of Manhattan, three or four of them were in the East Village. So eventually, um, Jiva Mukti opened a space on 2nd Avenue with classes all the time. I eventually taught there. This is before teacher training. Yeah. This is before Yoga Alliance. And uh, then some of they and some of the Jiva Mukti, my Jiva Mukti friends, traveled to Mysore and studied with Patabi Joyce and came back. That really changed the type of yoga that was being shared at Jiva Mukti. And then they hosted Patabi Joyce in 93. Mm. And that was like 50 people in a class at 6 in the morning. It was, you know, revolutionary. Mm. And... Uh, that was that. I went to India about a year later to study with Patabi Joyce. So it was 93 when you first met Patabi Joyce? When yes. he came to New York? Yes, okay. and I would say that though certainly, well, as a New Zealand friend of mine in Mysore once said, when we saw the New Yorkers coming, we were like, oh no, here come <laughs> the New Yorkers. It's over. <laughs> So, I, I mean, what was over? I mean, when I first went to study with Patabi Joyce, there was probably about 20 of us in the room, mm -hmm. 20 of us in all, maybe the second year, 95, 96 or 7, 30 students. Mm. But up till that time, there was maybe three at any given time or five. Wow. I would say every New Yorker that came, hold on. Um, I'm just getting this photo. Do I have it here? Every New Yorker that came every New Yorker that came went on to be, many of them went on to be some of our most prestigious yoga teachers today. So wow. a lot of people that were in those classes went to Mysore immediately, uh, opened their own yoga schools, practiced Ashtanga for many years, maybe integrated into increased studies, etc. Mm. So that is a photo from that 1993, wait, 1993 with Patabi Joyce at Jiva Mukti on 2nd Avenue. Wow, yes, Kiki just showed me a photo so that includes... Um, Allison West, David yes. Swenson, Beryl Bender, mm -hmm. um, uh, Eddie Stern, John Campbell... Lisa Shremp, who's mm. out in Phoenix now. Um, Alicia Lima, she was in L.A. for many years. Now she's back in her native Brazil teaching. 
amazing. Yeah. Great. So tell me a little bit about um, how, first of all, encountering um, Patabi Joyce and and sort of finding a modern guru that I'm that I. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, probably completely transformed like your relationship with this practice. Absolutely. And just tell me a little bit about like what that has meant to you and what it's what it's like to to experience that shift into a more, you know, a, a very special teacher student relationship. One thing I would say when I first was introduced to Patabi Joyce, just seeing him as a teacher mm-hmm. in these classes in New York, I didn't he, I didn't really understand a lot about him. Mm-hmm. And I was quite intrigued and also, um, you know, most of the yoga that we had been introduced to by Indians were renunciates. Yeah. And were North Indians. Mm-hmm. And Guruji Patabi Joyce was a householder. Yeah. And he was traveling with his wife, mm-hmm. and he had a family. So that was curious in sort of the scheme of things. Also, he taught so differently mm-hmm. than how we had been taught in general up to that time. So it's very hard to imagine this, but I'm going to you know, ask the listener to try Imagine no vinyasa classes, no (laughs) flow classes. Imagine no teacher even saying, inhale, do this, exhale, do that. Right. I mean, just like wipe the slate clean. It would be like an apocalyptic movie out of Hollywood. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So everything... Even beginning classes with sun salutations or having inversions at the end of the class, that's all from Ashtanga. Mm -hmm. Um, When people are like, well, I teach vinyasa, it has nothing to do with Ashtanga. I'm like, no, honey. It does. Um, You know, you might not know it, but, you know, it does. It's like when I talk with young artists and they don't know the full history of contemporary art, but any art that we see now, it can't be divorced or separated Mm -hmm. from all the art that precedes it. And so the yoga that we see now, uh, Patabi Joyce was a game changer. Totally. And um, so, and just the intensity and the sweating. No one ever sweat in yoga. Really? Really. (laughs) I can't imagine not sweating. No one sweat in yoga. We were in pools in that class. I mean, we literally had pools of sweat on our Mm. um, mats and it was August and it was really hot and so even at 6, 7 in the morning the sweat was condensing down the windows and down the walls and dropping off the ceiling Um, and then I really just observed the, the caring and the warmth and the devotion and the respect that the students around me who had previously studied with Patabi Joyce, that they had for Patabi Joyce. Yeah. And also I was really moved by how, how generous he was. He taught every person in that room. It was like he looked at the room and he was like, I'm gonna, gonna get these people help back here for the Janushir Shasans, but I'm going to get over that other side and help those people when we get to the Marichasanas or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. He really helped everyone. And there wasn't a favoritism. He didn't favor the bendy people over the stiff people. It was right. like he really, when I hosted him for the first time in L.A., I had a few students that I would really work so hard to get them to bind, <laughs> you know, uh, facilitate them binding in Maritasana A, B, C, or D, whichever mm-hmm. one it might have been. And maybe they would get there, they were breathing, they were in, I would get their fingers to grip, and then they would fly out of it. And they'd go, let's do it again. And as we were ramping up for Guruji to come, I sat down, I went to help them, and I said, if Patabi Joyce sits down to help you, 
don't let go. Like, don't waste that man's time. There's 250 people in this room, and he sat down to help you in one of these asanas, don't let go. And this one student, she said, oh, and I saw him sit down to help her, you know, and she said, all I could think was, don't let go, <laughs> don't let go. And she said, I didn't let go. I was like, I know, I was watching. But he was so, you know, he would go and help one and then the next and the next and the next and the next. Um, so his generosity, his dedication, like looking, you understand, like look in your eyes. Do you get it? Do you see it? Breathe, really listening to the breath. Um, it was all so new for me. Mm. And I really didn't think at that time. I'd always wanted to go to India. At that time, it didn't occur to me, I'm going to go to India to practice with him. Yeah. I just was, I just really observed mm -hmm. and had this incredible experience. And there was no Ashtanga program in New York at that time. And so a few girlfriends and I, we met every morning in the tiny back room at the then Jiva Mukti school, and we did a primary series. Amazing. Amazing. And then how many years after that until there was actually a, a, a primary class teacher in New York City? Um, I'd say probably Eddie Stern started spending right. a fair amount of time studying under Patavi Joyce, and then I can't say when it was, but maybe... 90, maybe six or seven. He mm -hmm. was teaching a little class, a small group, out of the back of like a Krishna center on St. Mark's Place. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that idea of daily practice and sort of doing the same thing every day, mm -hmm. that was very new. Yeah. That actually was the most... In, engaging thing to me about the Ashtanga. I'm, I love technique. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I said it experimental theater, I love technique. Mm -hmm. And I've always had mentors. Yeah. So to be learning a technique from a mentor um, and to, it's like doing scales. You know, you practice that every day, every day, and you get this solid foundation. Mm -hmm. But Tabby Joyce always said, these, these standing asanas are the foundation for all the other asanas. Mm -hmm. And they really are the foundation. They, if, when we, if we were just to practice Surya Namaskara A, B, standing asanas, it prepares the body really for all the subsequent asanas. And then each next asana, say in the primary series, when there is steadiness and ease there, that is the foundation for what comes next. Mm -hmm. It's like turning tumblers on a lock and opening the door. Mm -hmm. uh, and everything is taught like that in India. I think that a lot of students today, they're like, well, I heard in Ashtanga, you don't get moved forward. And you can't do this unless you can do that. Well, I went to study vocal, you know, uh, in India, and I started with harmonium, and mm -hmm. I started with basic scales, sangita, and I couldn't do songs mm -hmm. until I could do scales. Right. And just practicing scales every day for hours. Mm. So that's like your Surya Namaskar, or your standing asanas. You don't get to chant bhajan until you can do this. So everything is sort of qualifying like that. We could even say the Yoga Sutra, the way the sutra text unfolds, is in that same way. But Tabi Joyce also said that the third limb, asana, of the Ashtanga Yoga of Patanjali is the foundation for yama and niyama, for the first two limbs. Mm. So, um, so he was giving us, you know, that foundation. So then, um, I, I was, I had been introduced to Patabi Joyce, to this incredible experience. Was doing this daily practice, 
and I was had been planning to move to Los Angeles uh, to continue my work as an actress. And then in LA, I continued to do self practice. I were I got a job teaching yoga it's at different places in town, but at Yoga Works and. Mm-hmm. Mati Ezrati and Chuck Miller had founded Yoga Works, and they had a morning miser practice. Mm. And I think they also had an afternoon practice. So I would go in there a few days a week. And um, then the... But doing that practice... And then when I started to earn as an actress, and I sort of kind of booked a job that was a windfall sort of professionally and financially, the first thing I thought was, I'm going to Mysore. Mm. I, I'm doing this job for 10 weeks, uh, and then I have a down in Florida, then I have this independent film uh, opening in New York, and then I'm going to Mysore. And I put everything in storage and went off to do that. So as soon as I booked that job, I called my friend Lisa Schremp, who lived here, mm-hmm. and I said, I want to go to Mysore. When are you going? She said, I'm going in December. And it just matched my time frame perfectly. And I remember, and this is so crazy to think. So here I knew from like August that I was going to be going to India, August 95. And I got here December, let's say, to New York, December 1st or 3rd or 5th or something. And we were planning to go, I don't know, let's say the 15th. And we looked in the newspaper for tickets. <laughs> and we went to... And, an Indian-run travel agent in the Empire State Building. What? And we, we went, and we took the elevator, and we went into the office, and we sat down, and we, like, we got these tickets, and they were like, no, the newspaper said this, and we like negotiated the price down. And I think I paid in cash, because uh, when you work on a film, they give you this per diem. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, no, I'm just saving this per diem. This is taking <laughs> me to India. And uh, so I took this envelope, this seven hundred dollars, seven one hundred dollar bills of per diem a week, a hundred dollars a day, because I was in Florida, which yeah. is not my home. And um, we bought our tickets, and we flew to India. We bought our tickets, whatever, a week before we went, and then we stood online at the consulate and we got our visas, and off we went. Wow, wow. So tell me a little bit about. Um, when you encountered the Yoga Sutras and and how encountering yoga philosophy in this way has really um, influenced your perspective and maybe anything like substantial philosophically from the sutras that you want to share? Okay. Well, the way that Patabi Joyce taught very traditionally is this method of agama. Mm-hmm. And so in the Yoga Sutra, how do we know something to be correct knowledge, um, pramanani? It's because it's coming from the expert. So the yoga, and that's agama. The yoga shastra, the texts on yoga, the traditions on yoga, if it's coming from that, we would know it to be bona fide. Mm -hmm. Or if it's coming from the teacher, the, a master, a long-time experienced teacher. So when Patabi Joyce would teach, if we ever said, why are we doing it this way? Or if someone did it a different way, he said, no, you must do it this way. Because my guru, Krishnamacharya, he taught me that way. It's coming from the source, from the expert, or because the Yoga Sutra is telling, mm-hmm. the Shiva Samhita is telling, the Bhagavad Gita is, uh, is sharing it. Yeah. And so he, and then he would chant in Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. And then he would translate and explain and give a discourse. So I had been trying to study the Yoga Sutra. I mean, I studied a lot. And Jiva Mukti was great for encouraging us to read. But I was reading, you know, I'd read the Yogananda's, um, what is it? Now I can't remember. Self-Realization Fellowship. The Autobiography of a Yogi. I sent away for their weekly lessons that came in the mail and they all had you know Bhagavad Gita or other things in them I read a lot of the lives of the saints Mm -hmm. so um, reading about Ramana Maharshi or Vivekananda or so I was doing a lot a lot of reading and I was trying to tackle the yoga sutras but always in translation and Mm -hmm. never making 
too abstracted, I guess. So here, Patabi Joyce was really sharing from the Yoga Sutra, expounding on it. That made me interested in that. And just everything that he shared. He was giving us so much information. And he was telling us, uh, he was guiding us to stretch our minds Mm -hmm. and to learn everything. And he would, someone might ask, oh, should I study Bhagavad Gita? And he'd say, no, 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 just keep taking practice. He felt maybe that they needed more of a foundation before they came to that. Yet another student who he might have had for 10 years, he would be teaching Bhagavad Gita too, or sending us off to certain teachers to study. So, um, So that was my introduction. Well... What I saw was that he was living these philosophies. They were not separate from the practice. Everything was integrated. Mm -hmm. And so I began to understand or experience this as integrated knowledge. I think studying with Patabi Joyce at the time that I did, we had an opportunity to visit and sit with him every afternoon. And he shared in depth of his vast knowledge pool. And he was a highly regarded um, yoga vidvan and Sanskritist and um, Vedantin. Like, he was highly regarded by everyone. Mm -hmm. And... He shared that with us, mm. uh, and it was extraordinary. Mm-hmm. So, and he shared a lot of sort of what I call everyday Ayurveda with us. You know, a lot of people would ask questions about asana or pain or this or that, and he might talk about food and spices mm. and abhyanga or oil bath or certain herbs, and he was always sending people off to get herbs and things like that. So it was really a lot of stuff. It It was like a a truly holistic. Truly holistic. It wasn't just like do this asana practice, do this breathing movement system. Mm -hmm. That was definitely the most obvious um, teaching, but it was not the sum total of the teaching. Right, right. There were many limbs to it. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So so how has this worked sort of like um segueing into this nicely in 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 um some of your professional work you're known to be as we mentioned in the bio um really into you know organic living and and you're mentioning how even Patabi Joyce was sharing you know organic ways of of approaching holistic health. So I'm I'm curious just to hear what for those in the audience that perhaps don't know or are less familiar, what is um, no, non-plastic living? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, plas- plastic-free living, and and how is it important for um, a sustainable life on the on this planet? Well, my passion around plastic-free is multifold, but. I'm going to start with the human being, mm-hmm. and then we can move to the um, the planet and the other inhabitants on the planet. So plastic, we now see, and there's so much scientific research on it, is an endocrine disruptor. Mm. It's also called an estrogenizer. Mm. So when we use products, whether they're food products, particularly bottled water. If I could do anything today, if anyone's listening, please stop drinking bottled water. (laughs) And I hope I can give you a compelling enough reason why. Um, So when we are using maybe skincare products or eating foods that come out of plastic, that plastic has leached into these products. Wow. His his eye his eye uh, brows just shot up, everyone. If you could have seen how high they shot. So that means that this water that we're drinking is delivering estrogen to every cell. Whoa. So a lot of the cancers that we see today, and particularly for women, very strongly I feel, women absolutely must minimize the amount of exposure to, pra- to plastic. 
all of these um, diseases relating to reproductive organs. This is over estrogenization. And our, you know, just as women, our American women and women all over the world, but uh, we probably have a lot more plastic exposure here, uh, just as women are really coming into their kind of wisdom, whether it's in their 50s or 60s, so many of these women are being felled by cancer. Mm. And through that process of chemo and radiation and hormone suppressants, many of these women, a very high percentage, they never regain their health, their energy, their vibrant, you know, intellectual minds to ma- stay in the workforce and become female mm-hmm. leaders. Mm-hmm. And we need female leaders yeah. uh, in addition to other um, progressive and illuminated leaders. So we, estrogen has a symbiotic relationship with fat. Mm-hmm. So when we have this ex excess estrogen, these xenoestrogens, environmental estrogens, which are also coming from any product that has petroleum in it, Mm. like foods that are commercially grown with pesticides, insecticides, fertilizers, all from petroleum, all estrogenizing, any body care, laundry detergent, deodorant with a paraben mineral oil, mineral, petroleum, oil, all of these are estrogenizing. So we're just sucking them, eating them. We're just eating cancer. Gum is made of plastic. There's one brand of chewing gum. I, I don't know. I wanna, I'm not going to say it because I'm not sure, but do your research. All gum is plastic. You're buying plastic. You might as well be chewing on a bottle cap. Oh, my gosh. I love gum. Oh You're my terrifying gosh. me, Kiki. Oh my god, good, good. I've one one person, <laughs> one disruption of the day. That's yeah. all I need. Yeah. So, so start chewing on cardamom pods. <laughs> um, so why is this knowledge so not mainstream? Well, it's I mean, just it's becoming... so heavily suppressed. Yeah. So what happens is there was even an article in the Times: male infertility in America is on the rise. And this is thirty-year-old men. And this, they're, and so they're going to fertility specialists. And the top fertility specialist in New York City, he said in the Times, so American men are making less sperm, and the sperm is weaker. Mm. So this is the cause of the infertility. Right. The doctor said, stop drinking bottled water. Stop microwaving in plastic. Yeah. And in three months, the fertility is back up. So estrogen is depositing in fat, which is hip and breast tissue. When we see obese men that who have that kind of male type of breast, mm-hmm. that is estrogenized breast tissue. That is breast. That is not fat. It is actual breast Whoa. <laughs> so now these plastics are in the Great Lakes. They're in the ocean on these plastic islands. They're in the rivers. And the fish and sea life are being estrogenized. We have more hermaphroditic fish and infertile fish. So this is reducing the fish populations. Mm-hmm. And it's just continuing, continuing. So it's really an imperative get a water filter, carry your jug around, get a piece of charcoal, drop it in your water filter, and just drink water from the tap. Mm-hmm. Um, is water from the tap generally in New York City, is it generally safe? We should be filtering it. Filtering it. it. Definitely. Um, and so that's why I'm really passionate about it. So what happens is, as the amount of estrogen increases, it settles in fat, so the fat increases. Mm-hmm. So it's now there's all this estrogen. It has to be detoxed out of the body, methylized out through these safe pathways, but that's not happening. So there are many people who could 
try everything to lose weight, mm-hmm. and they won't because that there's so much estrogen in that fat. So... Is, is this reversible? Is this something that... It is reversible. So that's, you know, this is the main imperative for going organic mm-hmm. in everything that we do. Um, and uh, especially for our children, for our elderly populations, anyone we care about, we're not really paying extra for organic uh, because if we pay less for these other products... The cost of using them is our health, planetary health, and the health of, you know, the animal kingdom. So the final thing I would say about plastic is yoga really means awareness Mm -hmm. and conscientiousness, that we're really aware of every choice that we make and the outcomes to that. So... We could say, well, I don't care. I'm going to still drink from plastic. Yeah. But at a certain point, as we continue to practice yoga, we do feel more and more responsibility. We take more responsibility for our actions. Karma... Karma is... The yogi's path is an individual path. And of course, one follows sort of universal or imposed moral codes or obeys the law, etc. But for the yogi, for the yoga practitioner, the sadhaka, I don't really use the term yogi or yogini. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe in a text with a girlfriend, but um, I don't think it's really appropriate for me or others, certainly my teacher was a yogi and I've met some extraordinary yogis. We're sadhakas, we're seekers. So the yoga practitioner understands, especially in studying the sutra uh, and continuing to practice, that each of my acts, whether in thought, word, or deed, creates a seed in consciousness, in my consciousness, which is vast and connected to all consciousness. consciousness. So each act will either have merit, um, punya, or it will lack merit, Mm -hmm. a punya or papa. And that seed will root grow and fruit and the fruits of those these seeds will either have merit that will benefit that will speed me along my way uh, or it will lack merit and cause challenges to me so at a certain point personal responsibility is a huge part of the yoga practice mm-hmm. So when I might say, okay, I don't care about drinking from plastic or I don't care about putting this plastic, this, these poisons on my skin that go through my... We, women, we eat our lipstick off our lips. I don't know where people think their petroleum-based chapstick is going. It's going into their bloodstream. Um, is Burt's Bees okay? Um, you have to look at it. I don't know. One of the big companies bought Burt's Bees, so I don't know. It's not chapstick, I hope. Take a look. Um, So we have a responsibility. How am I going to dispose? I'm taking this plastic bottled water. How am I going to dispose of this bottle? I'm responsible for that action. So if someone stops buying plastic, you know, I know, I mean, I go to this, I bike by this Costco over here. I see how many people are bringing cases of plastic bottled water into their home. Now they're responsible. They've taken responsibility for what becomes of that plastic. Mm. And though we recycle, most of that plastic will end up by the side of the road, the side of the highway, in the bushes, in the water. And even when plastic is recycled, I was like, well, what happens to this plastic? Our, it goes to the recycling plant and it's made as small as possible and it's shipped to usually China or it's made into pellets. And then those pellets are made into 
children's toys, clothes, and then and other things, and then shift again. So as I say, you know, my plastic is going on a worldwide cruise. <laughs> So really like taking responsibility for all of that. I had lived in Hawaii for several years and I had to take, we took our own trash to the dump and you're on an island and that trash is going to go on a barge and it's going to go out into the sea and dump, dump. It's, it's ju- dumped in the sea. Dumped. All of our trash is dumped. And so I really reduced how much waste I brought in my door so that I didn't have to take it back at my door. I'd be like, wait, these gluten-free crackers are in cardboard, then plastic, then plastic. I'm not, I'm not getting them. So, um, so it's about, so this kind of responsibility of the sadhaka for our actions. And I'm not saying by any means that I'm you know, have somehow figured out to be 100% plastic-free. There's some incredible blogs out there, people who are, and there's some incredible advice to continue to reduce plastic in our lives. Um, but, you know, in any area of responsibility, whatever, just doing the best that we yeah. can. Do you know any of those resources off the top of your head, like any books that you might recommend? or? I or the- don't. I just can only say, like, Google plastic-free Free blog, living. and yeah. it's hugely inspiring. Mm-hmm. So that I love the way that you expressed um, that idea of responsibility as actually, you know, thinking or considering meditating on the the kind of life trajectory of a bottle, you know, and and seeing that your purchasing of a bottle could actually be the reason why a child ends up with a toy, you know, that's made of the same thing as what you these drank out of. Children are sucking these toys. Yeah. It's the reason that we have so much obesity in small children Mm. because of all the plastic estrogen exposure. Wow. I had clients, private yoga clients, who had grandchildren, and they loved their grandchildren. They bought them lots of, you know, Fisher-Price type toys, bouncy things, and all these things. And I walked into the house, and I smelled the plastic. I just was greeted with the smell of plastic, and it, it... made me feel physically ill mm. Mm. and children are like chewing their their um the trays on their you know chairs and they're chewing everything and just sucking that down wow i mean that would really i mean a, a plastic free nursery a child yeah. would look very different from what we see today in a, just a standard nursery yeah. because so every children's toy i mean that i can even think of off the top of my head unless it's like you know building blocks or something which are made of wood but even that it's like aren't the paints themselves also right well this is when i should be plugging my friends uh wood toy company one of my theater friends um, and I can't think what the name of it is, but the Waldorf schools, for mm-hmm. example, um, they don't, you know, the children are sort of using only wooden toys and there's a lot of schools now that kids are not bringing sort of advertising type TV character lunch boxes and stuff into the school. So there are movements towards this, but certainly everything should be child safe. Yeah. And I think that... Um, the thing when we look at things that are well made or are natural or organic, um, you know, even if we're just using pure organic coconut oil on our skin, it's very satisfying. It nourishes us. And we can kind of buy a lot of crap to try to make ourselves feel well. Like, oh, I got these lipsticks. They were only 99 cents or something. But we're not really satisfied. We just buy more and more and more. You know, most, I think, teenager, teenage girls apply lip gloss at least 17 times a day. Wow. So we're, we're trying to, like, from this Ayurvedic point of view, we have to nourish all the senses. We actually feed our senses, right? So... You know, I have all these plants here, I have these flowers, I look at these plants and these colors, the vibrancy, it's feeding my eyes. We damage our senses if I was just on my phone all day or maybe, you know, gaming or just 
bombarding, always on a screen, from an Ayurvedic point of view, we're actually damaging the sense organ. Mm. And now that sense organ is damaged, it can no longer assess what it needs. We need to nourish the tongue, we need to nourish the six tastes. And if we're only nourishing two, sweet and salty. My two favorite things. And we're not getting the other four. So now and what are the, other four? the tongue is damaged. And so we have all of these Americans just chasing sweet and salty. And sweet and salty are feeding obesity. Because sweet is what you give babies. The mother's milk is the first sweet. And babies need to gather tissue because they're growing. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point when we reach adulthood, we don't want to gather that tissue. We can't handle it. It creates obesity. Mm -hmm. So Americans don't usually eat pungents and bitters, you know, these other flavors. These act on the liver. They balance sweet and salty. Salt, you know, maintains water. So mm -hmm. we're increasing weight retaining. with salt, we're retaining, and we're increasing weight with sweet. I have a friend who's very sweet sensitive, very kapha. She said to me years ago, I can think about cake and I gain weight. That's how powerful the senses and the mind is and everything. So we, you know, we, we're overexposing ourselves or our senses, our sense organs to harmful things and it's deeply damaging. We have to reset um, and we have to take from these other areas. Yeah. And I mean, it's so challenging because it seems the cards are stacked against us in a certain way because most grocery stores are not catering to this kind of no. concern at all. And now everything is grab and go. It's already in plastic packages. Right, right. And we've turned into a snack culture. People are just snacking all day long. It's just like, like how how moms give their babies the little goldfish and the little cereal snacks and the little mini fruit uh, strips or whatever. Just like the babies, you're just feeding them snacks like snack all day long. Well, babies, to a certain degree, growing children do need to eat all day long when they're active, right? Because they're burning those calories and they need more fuel. It's just like energy out, energy in, energy out, energy in. That's very true for active children. And um, they do need to eat healthfully. The more sedentary we become, um, then we don't need as many, much fuel in, right? But also, Americans are turning into a snacking culture, like babies, where they're snacking all day and they're sedentary. And there's a lot of stuff out there like, oh, we should be snack eating five meals a day or snacking. It's like, yeah, if you're training for a marathon, maybe you could eat five meals a day. If you're, you know, if you're 22 years old and you're swimming, you know, for your university or something like that, like, yeah, yeah you could eat five times a day. But people always ask me through my YouTube channel, um, on my blog, and Kiki, what are healthy snacks? And it's like, there are no healthy snacks because snacking isn't healthy. <laughs> Unless you're a baby or a toddler or a teen. Like when I was a teen, you know, I ran before school. I competed. I trained with the track team after school. I competed regularly. I came in the house. I was ravenous. Mm -hmm. I could eat whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. It was like fuel in, energy out. Um, but then if we become sedentary, we can't. But if we're still growing... We're nourishing the growth. We're feeding the growth. Mm. I just fed my plants recently. I mean, you can see how big those leaves are. This thing grew all the way down to the ground in like four days. What? It was like halfway there and like I fed it. I was like, I have to get food for these guys. And most of these were, I was given to them by other people. So they were like sad, failing plants. And now they're like, they're, they're gargantuan. People are like, what is it? I'm like, that's a ficus. They're like, that's a ficus. It's like out of Jurassic Park. <laughs> so 
So I fed them organic food, and they they grew. Um, yeah, I was going to ask. Organic is, is when you fed them. You don't mean like miracle grow. No, it was. It's an organic, um, an organic version of miracle grow, like a, a nitrogen something, and you I just see. put these little pods in there and water them, and like overnight they were like. Like, they're like, thank you so much. Um, so, um, so yes, the snacking culture, everything in plastic, eating all day long. It's like we've really gotten away. And it's a big boon for the food companies because they have us eating all day long. But we do have to step away. We have to reclaim our minds. What are we going to expose our minds to? You know, that's our choice. Um, my mother says she often tells her friends, None of my daughters have televisions. <laughs> you know, that, yeah, I don't have a television because I choose, you know, I choose when I crawl in bed with the laptop and watch nine episodes of Mad Men over okay, a weekend. I was going to ask. I choose. I was going to be like, Kiki, okay, you've got it. You've got it. I choose. Let's have a show. I choose how much Jillian Anderson in the fall I watch. But, um. Any Game of Thrones in there? Not yet. Okay. But um, but I'm not being, you know, I'm not exposing myself to commercials or, yeah, you know, true. these different things. So, um, but you were talking about the yogi and the sadhaka thing. Yeah, I would love to just hear, I mean, I think it's really, uh, you've said so many amazing things and I'm so grateful that we've got on this topic um, and, ex- and explored it so much because it really is, um, I, I love how you talked about it as being a really a really strong component of, of the seat, the practice of seeking. And, and you did mention how you feel like it's more appropriate designation to refer to ourselves as sadhikas rather than yogis. And so I'd love for you to kind of explore what you mean by that and, and why maybe calling ourselves yogis or yoginis is problematic. Yeah. I mean, people can call themselves yogis and yoginis, but a yogi would be someone who is realized, Yeah. right? They're in yoga mind or they just, they have um, a great, you know, they have attained to some level of viveka, mm-hmm. of high discernment. And the Mahavrata, the great vow um, of the yogi is ahimsa, satya, asteya, brahmacharya, aparigraha, is the yama. And when we take this universal vow of um, then we become a member of the universal family, Mm. right? It ends preferential treatment. So um, it means like, okay, I'm, I'm going to take this vow of ahimsa and I'm not going to harm, um, I mean, you know, my family, but am I going to harm other people? Mm-hmm. You know, even if we think like, oh, well, you know, that person, uh, that person got caught and they got the death penalty and they deserve it for what they did. For me to participate in some kind of joy, Mm. knowing that a life is being taken, uh, that harms me. Mm. Uh, That harms, that goes against ahimsa. So yes, we practice, people practice yoga and they love it. And there's so many schools and so many gyms and fitness centers and there's just yoga, yoga, yoga and everyone's running around to yoga and they're loving it. That's great. But to really understand what a yogi is, what the mind is to make these commitments to the yama and the niyama, it's quite fraught. Even in the Mahaparat, um, grandfather Bhishma, this great king has been offended and he says fine you don't trust me you don't believe me I'll walk away from the kingdom I will take a vow of pramachari 
And they said, no, no, grandfather, no. You are so powerful that if you keep that vow of brahmachari, you would be able to destroy the entire planet. Mm. So it's one becomes very, to have that level of virya um, that comes from taking the, the amount of vitality and illumination that comes from taking these vows the great um, anti-heroes in the Ramayana, in the Mahabharata, they were yogis. And they became so powerful that the gods bowed to them. Mm. And the gods imbued them with these weapons of destruction. Uh, So yoga is very powerful. And the path to truly be A yogi is very powerful, it's very fraught, it's very dangerous. Um, So we are seekers, you know, or sadhakas. We're practicing sadhana. I will be speaking on the sadhana pada uh, for your uh, online program. So I think for someone who has studied yoga for a while, maybe 10 years or more or something, they'll have had enough experiences to understand like, oh, it's not all fun and games. This mm-hmm. is actually, there's a lot of responsibility yeah. here. Yeah, I I think that's such a uh, an important distinction that you're making. And it, because as I'm sure we could, you know, have a long conversation about um, what has become called yoga now is often very much divorced from the depth and the intensity and really the dedication that you're referring to. And so to be called a yogi is a certain, uh, is indicative of a certain level of, of achievement that is important to honor and respect and to acknowledge. And so the, the distinction I, I feel like between sadhaka and yogi is reminding us that there's somewhere to go. There's some work to be done. We're not just a yogi because we showed up in an asana class one day. We have work to do. And so I really... But we all start there. Yeah. We all start at the beginning. Right. Right? Um, And I think something also that ties into this idea of a seeker is some people will continue to seek Mm -hmm. to um, more studies and more knowledge or to authentic uh, knowledge systems or yoga systems, etc. So... Um, certainly when I went to India, I just thought I would go once (laughs) like, wow, I went to India and it blew my mind and I had amazing experiences. Mm. Uh, but I was really moved to deepen my knowledge. And Patavi Joy said to all of us, you know, each student, every student, you go home, take practice every day come back next year you come back next year Mm. he was so excited to see every student that came back Mm. Mm. you know we it's not like some people were chosen or pre-ordained or predestined to have a meaningful a close relationship with Patabi Joyce and to be the recipient of an enormous amount of knowledge everyone qualified for that Mm. he shared that with everyone and the more that someone came before him and the more profound their questioning became or the more curious they became or the more um one understood like god i thought i knew a lot but now i don't know anything (laughs) and asked questions uh to learn the more he shared and the more he shared so, you know, if we just stand on the periphery and look in, maybe one wouldn't understand all that was being shared there. Mm. And I think even his neighbors and stuff, when they saw the, the foreign students coming, were like, what are they doing at his house? Mm. What could he be doing there that's so special? Mm. Um, but, um, you know, that changed. Eventually they saw, oh, the ones who didn't know, we have a, we have a rare vidvan, mm. we have a rare treasure in our midst. But Tavi Joyce 
like Krishnamacharya before him, like Mr. Iyengar, they were like the last of a generation of knowledge holders. Yeah. And Patavi Joyce was overseeing a Homa, um, you know, a Vedic fire ceremony. Um, he knew every word, every pronunciation, every he would not hesitate to say no, that is that is incorrect. Right. Or sit up straight or stop falling like this is important. So he had all that knowledge. My teacher, Dr. Jayashri, who I have studied Sanskrit and philosophy under for many years, uh, I brought her to meet Patavi Joyce and she's a trained South Indian Carnatic singer and he asked her to sing for him and she sang for him and he corrected her on a few words in these old poetic songs and he was like nope it's this mm -hmm. and she said thank you Guruji I will never I will only say it this way going forward she said I had heard it both ways he goes it's this way and she respected mm -hmm. she came from a family with their own gurus and she was highly knowledgeable especially for, as a woman in her family, they had given her all the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And when, and she had a PhD in Sanskrit from oh, Bangalore wow. University. And when she came to Patavi Joyce's home to meet him, she immediately bowed to him because of his knowledge, yeah. because he was a knowledge holder. So as much as we could learn, as, as much as we could seek to learn, to engage, the more I knew or we could learn or we could study, the more we could engage with him as we increased our vocabulary. Right. But the thing about seeking is when one is a seeker, one seeks more knowledge. One travels to India. One, you know, looks, one reads deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's... that's you know, we're, we're coming sort of to the end of our time mm -hmm. together. So I, I guess sort of on that note of, of seekers, is there any kind of last final parting offering words that you'd like to give to the audience, suggestions or, or um, anything you'd like to share? I think it's yoga sharanam mama. Yoga is my refuge. To be able to practice yoga, to be exposed to yoga, it's really an extraordinary gift because it changes our lives. It changes the very fabric of our consciousness. And, you know, we, when we come to yoga, I think it's very important to have a sankalpa, to have a resolve to put in the front of our mind. Um, gratitude for this yoga very often we think well, what does this yoga do for me mm -hmm. I'm fit, I'm strong really to come in service to the yoga yeah. to this vast technology of transformation these are technologies mm -hmm. for transformation and to come to know that those gems are there we might not see these jewels but they will be offered to us when we come with respect and service to the yoga um, and the yoga is a refuge it takes everyone everyone can come and practice yoga it's not just for a few the Tavi Joy said over and over again this is a universal system and that's also what the sutra says, Jati Desha Kala Samayana Vachinna Saurava Bhauma Mahavratam. In taking this Yama, this Mahavratam, it is Saurava Bhauma. It is for all beings, it is universal. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of Jati Desha Kala, regardless of where I am born, whether I'm born as a man or as a woman or um, Desha, regardless of the country I'm born in, Kala, regardless of the time that I'm born in, um, Samayana, regardless of the circumstances, 
I can, I can uh, embrace this path. It's for everyone, and I can benefit from the gifts of this path, um, which are, um, you know, shared in those sutras around the eight limbs and more. Wow. That's a beautiful, beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much, Kiki. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to chat with yes, you in I your really beautiful enjoyed home. This. Thank you. Um, I, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity just to kind of share the ways in which our listeners can uh, can learn more about you. If you want to share any projects sure. that you're working on, your websites and, and okay. so on and so forth. My website is Kiki Flynn, K-I-K-I-F-L-Y-N-N.com. You can go there and sign up for my newsletter. And then... In my newsletter will be any yoga, um, yoga workshops and things like that. Also, I have a busy YouTube channel, which mm-hmm. is on my website, but on YouTube, that's Kiki Says, S-A-Y-S, and that's inspirational stuff around organic living, organic lifestyle, responsible lifestyle, and then a lot about maybe Ayurvedic herbs and things like that. Um, and one thing that I'm doing that I'm really excited about is I'm going to be teaching the first teaching clinic in Abu Dhabi. And I was teaching there in the winter and everyone invited me back and said, you have to come teach the teacher said, you have to come teach us how to teach. So that's in uh, the beginning of September. And uh, it was very exciting to be in Abu Dhabi because in terms of yoga, it's almost like being in America 20 years ago. Mm. People are just being introduced to yoga and very excited about it and very respectful of, of the yoga. Mm. So if anyone is in that part of the world, uh, come to Abu Dhabi. It'll be three days of the most of an opportunity for me to be absolutely generous with everything that I have to share and want to share. So you'll find out about that on my website. Excellent. Yeah. Great. And also uh, for the listeners, Kiki is going to be teaching a couple of um, courses or a couple of modules that are going to be included in an online course that we're launching in the fall of 2016. Kiki will be speaking on the Yoga Sutras. So uh, keep an eye on the website for that. And uh, until next time, uh, thank you, Kiki, so much. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye-bye. Well, everybody, that's our interview. I hope you enjoyed what, for me at least, was a very mobilizing conversation. I know I'm already starting to think about plastic differently. Thank you, Kiki. Um, So if you want to hear more about Kiki, just check out her website, Kiki Flynn, K-I-K-I-F-L-Y-N-N dot com, and be sure to subscribe to her YouTube channel, Kiki Says. And as usual, if you're enjoying these conversations, these interviews on Chitheads, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. It really helps to push the podcast out in front of more eyes so that other people can learn from these great conversations as well. So thank you so much for your support. Bye-bye. Until next time. Namaste.